Coming up on KCCI 8 News Close Up, E15 mandate. The Iowa legislature overwhelmingly passes a bill requiring most gas stations to sell the ethanol blended fuel, why some lawmakers don't like the plan. Plus, child care shortage. Lawmakers also pass a bill supporters say will increase the amount of daycare in Iowa, the concerns both daycare owners and parents have. And he's one of three Republicans running for the congressional seat held by Democrat Cindy Axney. Five questions we put to Zach Nunn. This is Iowa's news leader. This is KCCI 8 News Close Up. Good morning and thank you for joining us for KCCI 8 News Close Up. I'm Scott Carpenter. The Iowa legislature has gone into overtime. Lawmakers hope to wrap things up for the session 12 days ago, but Republicans continue to disagree among themselves on several issues. But one thing most Republicans and Democrats at the State House agree with last week was a bill mandating almost every gas station in Iowa to sell the higher ethanol blended gasoline E15. In the Iowa Senate, only three lawmakers voted against the plan. Here's what those both for and against the mandate said before last week's vote. I rise today in support of uh, House File 2128. This legislation supports our rural farmers. It also supports uh, the people working in our biofuels industry, uh, even within my own district, the biofuel plant in uh, Washington, Iowa. Uh, you know, 32% or more of our budget is directly related to the ag industry and this is a um, step in the right direction for Iowa. This will help um, our economy in rural Iowa as well as urban Iowa. So it'll help uh, with clean air and clean energy and renewables for the future are what we need for growing our economy, creating jobs and sustainable jobs. I support our farmers. I support our fuel retailers. And yes, you can do both. I've been painted as anti-ethanol uh, uh, senator, I think, because I'm probably the only person here that actually owns fuel stores and understand the concepts that are in these bills a little bit more. You know, as a fuel reseller, we don't make any more money whether we sell clear fuel, an E10, or an E15. Tax incentives are put in there to lower the cost of it. Um, and the profit on the product is the same. There's very, very little profit in actual fuel. The money's made on the $2 pop or the $3 piece of pizza that's sold inside the store. And to have to invest crazy amounts of money to sell a product that you don't sell any more money on when there is a large group of uh, uh, people, uh, our farming community or resellers, the renewable fuel industry that do profit from it, while they don't have or have not had or not been asked to invest into the infrastructure that opens up 57% of their uh, uh, their corn, uh, provides a market for 57% of their corn to me, it's just, it, it's, it's, it bothers me. It bothers me that, that the, uh, the money that does go into this program is really uh, from our taxpayers. Um, now this year's bill, it is a mandate. We are mandating that all retailers must sell E15. How am I going to vote? What is the right thing to do? I'm a farmer, like many of us on the Republican side here. I grow a lot of corn and soybeans. And I also uh, have a few shares in a ethanol plant. Not a whole lot anymore, but a few. And uh, what happens to ethanol is important to me. But those things that I'm thinking about in the morning when I wake up early and I just can't get back to sleep is, is this the purpose of government? Are we trying to pick winners and losers? Uh, it seems like this company or this country was uh, founded on the ideas of Adam Smith and free enterprise. And I see this infringing on those, um, those rights, those freedoms that we have. I've had a lot of conversations with people from the ethanol industry, people from the Corn and Soybean Association. And when I talk about this, and I talk about the fact that I don't like mandating what some stations have to do. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I, I support efforts to grow the ethanol industry. I support Iowa farmers. Um, 
we want to see E15 do well. We want to see it do well in the marketplace. But, but like Senator Groot, I, I'm a believer that the marketplace is the best place to do it because in, in a free market, the success of a product is defined by the choices of the consumer rather than the government. And philosophically, when you mandate something, you know, you're kind of telling that business, we're going to define you. This, in my mind, puts us on the wrong trajectory. We're all very upset about the vaccination mandates when the government said, you know, you will be vaccinated or you won't have a job to our health care workers. And we just seem to be on this path where there's just too much comfort with the government making these kinds of power grabs into our private lives and businesses and then handing us the bill for it. So um, I understand the motivation to promote ethanol and I think some very good arguments were made. Uh, I do think E15 is going to survive and do well on its own merits in the market and I, I just don't think we need to involve Iowa taxpayers in that conversation nor do we need to fo force the smaller uh, family-owned businesses to pick up the tab for all the infrastructure that's going to be asked of them. This legislation is good for Iowa. The legislation opens new markets for Iowa's ethanol, cleaner, greener, renewable fuel. Iowa Biofuel Standards is estimated to boost Iowa's GOP by $457 million, support 3,500 new jobs, add $550 million dollars to the Iowa household income and create state and local revenue increase state and local revenue tax by 180 million dollars over the next five years those are big numbers for our state guys when we talk and look at our nation's need for energy independence Iowa is poised and in a great position to play a key role now, the bill, which was supported by Governor Kim Reynolds, is now awaiting her signature before it becomes law. This bill requires all gas stations offer E15 gasoline by 2026. However, the bill does have some exemptions. Gas stations that don't have equipment that can handle E15 can request a waiver. Stations that sell less than 300,000 gallons of gas a year can also get an exemption if the station's owner has 10 or fewer stations and if that owner hasn't sold E15 in the past. Republican lawmakers also passed a bill last week that supporters say will help expand child care in Iowa. Next on Close Up, why some child care providers and parents say this bill could actually make things worse. Join Jason Sudeiko and KCCI viewers. Welcome back to Close Up. According to the governor's office, Iowa has lost 33% of its child care business over just the last five years, leaving Iowa short around 350,000 child care slots for kids under 12 years old. 
Last week, the Iowa legislature passed House File 2198. That bill would allow teenagers as young as 16 to work in child care facilities and watch children unsupervised, as well as increase the number of young children each child care employee can watch. Right now, each child care employee can watch a maximum of six two-year-olds. Under this bill, that increases to seven. And while employees can now watch eight three-year-olds, the bill increases that number to ten. Now, supporters say this will help increase the number of child care spots in Iowa, while those opposed say this will do little but overwork already stressed child care workers. Senate Amendment 8362 adds to the... Um 16 and 17 year old child care bill, House File 2131. This was a recommendation from the, the Governor's Child Care Task Force that asked DHS to review child to staff ratios in child care centers. The amendment gives the option to child care providers to increase staff to child ratio for two year olds by one child and increase the ratio for three year olds uh, to two, by two children. These changes will align Iowa with the majority of other states. It doesn't fix our own child care crisis, and it hasn't in our neighboring states that have increased ratios. And this bill is still distracting from our real issues, which is providing affordable, accessible, and quality child care. We also need to work on sustaining and retaining our early childhood workforce, and this does nothing for that as well. So what do parents and child care workers think of this bill? KCCI's Amanda Rooker spoke with a child care worker and mother who says the bill could have some unintended consequences. As a parent, it's very concerning. Um, I know that this will have an effect on the health and safety of my children and, you know, the quality of education and care that they're going to receive. You know, I think a lot of people come into the child care industry thinking that, you know, we're going to get to play with kids and we are educators and there's so much more to that and we're not being treated as educators. When you're in a classroom, you are in charge of, you know, their physical health and their social and emotional and that's one adult for all of those kids to try to fit those needs and it's stressful and again, this bill just isn't helping. The bill is now awaiting Governor Reynolds' signature, but there are still several bills the legislature will be working on when they come back into session tomorrow. They include the state's budget, changes to the state's bottle deposit bill, school transparency, and school vouchers. Coming up on Close Up, he's an Air Force officer and an Iowa State Senator. Why Zach Nunn thinks that experience will help make him Iowa's next third district congressman. What makes A-plus the best? It's our
Well, from now until the June 7th primary vote, KCCI will help you learn about the candidates running for Iowa's top political offices. Three Republicans are running in Iowa's 3rd Congressional District for the chance to take on two-term incumbent Democrat Cindy Axney in the November election. Now, this morning, Close Up continues our profiles of those candidates, focusing now on Zach Nunn. KCCI's Amanda Rooker recently sat down with Nunn talking about his life experience and why he argues it would make him Iowa's best representative for the 3rd District. Well, for many, you are a familiar face around Iowa, but for those that don't know you, you know, tell me a little bit about yourself and your background. Thanks, Amanda. Well, yeah, we've been privileged to serve Iowa in a legislative capacity for the last eight years. Um, won the opportunity to represent my hometown community uh, in the House and then went on to turn a six-decade Democrat seat to Republican and help win back a larger leadership role in the Senate. Part of that served um, for uh, just over a decade in the U.S. military, flying with the U.S. Air Force. Today I command an Air Force squadron and um, just very privileged to have this be my home state. But also I think that, you know, what works well in Iowa could be a model for the rest of the country. And that's one of the reasons we're excited now to be running for Congress. Yeah, tell me more about that. What motivates this, this run for Congress for you? Well, so you know, I've always been a believer that we have a lot of talent here. And one of the things is I want to continue to cultivate a good bench um, in Iowa's leadership corridors. And that means getting out of the House, out of the Senate, allowing new people to run. At the same time, I would offer Washington also needs some new ideas. Um, when we first considered running, my wife and I, uh, we were really not infatuated with the idea, but some friends mentioned to us, you know, when good people stop serving, then that's not great for democracy. And so following that kind of George Washington model of serve your country in any capacity that you can, I think that, you know, the failure in Afghanistan this past year, the tragedy of lack of defined American leadership in the world from the Ukraine to China to the Middle East, I'm hoping that I can leverage both my background, but what I'm hearing from my constituents of really trying to find someone who can help serve the country. Now we've been asking all the candidates in the June 7th primary five questions. Inflation, voting rights, immigration, education, and the Second Amendment. Coming up, Close Up puts those questions to 3rd District candidate, Zach Nunn. Join Jason Sudeiko and KCCI.
Well, KCCI is asking each candidate in the June primary five questions. Those questions deal with inflation, voting rights, immigration, education, and the Second Amendment. The last two weeks, third district candidates Nicole Hasso and Gary Leffler shared their thoughts. This morning, KCCI's Amanda Rooker puts those same five questions to their opponent, Republican Zach Nunn. Now, there are five topics that we're <laughs> asking every candidate. Yeah. So, well, the first one was the economy. I know that's something that you just kind of addressed. Um, one, a recent poll shows that Americans listed inflation as the most urgent issue facing our country right now. Yeah. I know you kind of addressed that a little bit, but is there anything else you would add of how you would address that concern at the federal level? Yeah. So. Inflation should be of concern to every American right now, not just from a national security standpoint that it destabilizes the dollar, but for middle and low income families that even if they get a dollar raise at whatever job they have, they're seeing a vast greater increase on just the price of everyday goods. You know, bacon and eggs is up um, dollars on the pound. We're seeing an increase at the fuel pump that's doubled it. You know, this is the kind of stuff that starts to shred apart a good community when people can't even afford to get to work or take their kids to school. At the federal level, I think there's a number of things we can do. The first one, stop ridiculous spending. One of my first priorities would be able to say is, hey, we're going to balance the annual budget and pass a budget, something that Congress has not done for a decade, you know, Republican or Democrat. We've done it in Iowa and we've shown that it works. The second aspect is immediately get the out of control runaway inflation on key commodities like gasoline and food under control. And that's something the federal government can be much better about if it gets itself out of the business of trying to control the market. Now, the next topic is on education. That's been a hot topic at the State right. House this session. But looking at the federal level, do you think that there should be action uh, on education in Congress? And what would that look like? Yeah, so I do think the feds have a role to play in this, right? Um, first, let states be the grand laboratories of experimentation here. I think a number of states, Iowa included, has been very good at funding public education year after year. Every year I've been in the Senate and the House, we have funded new dollars to education. At the same time, we're trying out new experiments. We're looking in the Senate right now of this school scholarship to allow parents more choice, particularly for low-income families. Let's find out how that works in Iowa because a schoolhouse in Iowa is gonna be very different than a schoolhouse in Florida, New York, or Oklahoma. The feds can do that by removing a lot of the red tape at the top. And that's where I think restricting what the Department of Ed is enforcing for curriculum, for budgeting, for planning for schools, could be better left to the individual states and their respective school districts. Now, the next topic is on immigration. Uh, yeah. Where do you stand on, you know, what would immigration reform look like to you and the state of our border right now? Immigration reform, I think, needs to be one of the number top three issues that Republicans are looking at when they take control of Congress. First, secure our southern border. There is nothing worse than those who come here illegally being afforded things that those who came here legally haven't even been able to receive access to. And then the second part of that is, is identifying that America welcomes immigrants. Um, the people who are hurt most by illegal immigration are the people who came here the right way. But at the federal level, we have far too many barriers for good uh, immigrants to come here and become first generation Americans. And that's something that should be a bipartisan solution that we can start working on now and will be a top priority for me going forward because workforce, if you talk to anybody in the state or the country, is something huge. And I think that that's an area where we can not only work forward for, but provide a good on ramp for folks who want to come here and work legally and do a better job preventing folks who come here illegally from exploiting the system. Now, another thing that has been, you know, a hot topic at the congressional level is uh, things around voting rights and election right. security. You know, congressional Democrats have pushed to expand voting rights legislation. Yeah. On the other side of the aisle, you have arguments uh, to secure our elections, to do more on election integrity. What do you think um, between those two things, and do you think there should be election law reform? I'll be very clear on this. I think this is where Iowa got it right, and Congress got it dead wrong. In Congress, they're looking to federalize all of our elections and make it run by one body in a place where they almost didn't let a duly elected U.S. Congressperson, uh, Miller Meeks, even sit. They were going to overturn the decision of the people. 
And we've also seen some of the worst gerrymandering come out of, you know, blue states. Um, I think Iowa does a nonpartisan redistricting map, very fair. That should be the model that we're looking at and allowing states to do it. Additionally, we have extended windows for early voting here in Iowa. In fact, far more liberal than our blue states on the East Coast. So where I was asking for integrity in our elections, paper ballots, photo ID, affirmation that you actually live in a location, that's a best practice, again, that Iowa has led in and should be modeled by other states, not wholesale taken over by the federal government. Now, uh, you have long been a Second Amendment advocate. Right. Um, what would that look like for you in Congress? Well, tell me a little bit about what that's looked like actually at the State House for you, and then, you know, how would that carry over to if you were elected to Congress? So, you know, Iowa, and myself included as a military member, feel very strongly on all of our constitutional rights. The Second Amendment has been very important here. In Iowa's Constitution, we don't have Second Amendment protections. That's something that we've led at the State House and received overwhelming bipartisan support. And voters are going to get to decide in November whether they want that in the Constitution or not. I think we're going to see a huge turnout focused on that issue. The second aspect is, is gun rights that are truly aligned with the Second Amendment. That meaning that you have the right to bear arms and those should not be infringed upon. What I don't want to see is that a federal agency like the ATF or Department of Justice decides one day to write a memorandum that goes into effect and a person who has a legal weapon the night they go to bed wakes up the next morning being a criminal in their own neighborhood. We have far too many decisions being outsourced to the bureaucracy and not being passed by Congress or signed by the president. And that's just dangerous for our country. And wrapping up, uh, on June 7th, Iowans head to the polls. What's your elevator pitch? Why should Iowans vote for you? Hey, first off, I appreciate every Iowan who goes out. Remember to vote in the primary. We've been serving our country overseas for nearly two decades now. We have a proven record at the State House of not only winning elections against incumbent Democrats, but also returning results when we're elected to office. You know, I don't always vote with the majority. In fact, I've stood up to them on things like the gas tax before. But what I will always do is represent my constituents to be able to serve them and put forth the best possible policies to promote Iowa and hopefully lead our country in a way that looks a lot more like what Iowa does here really well. Well, next week, close up on close up, we will meet the candidates who are looking to be Iowa's next U.S. Senator, starting with one time Iowa Congresswoman Abby Finkenauer. And one month before the June 7th primary, KCCI will host a debate between the three Democratic candidates for U.S. Senate. Abby Finkenauer, Michael Franken, and Glenn Hurst will face off here at KCCI Studios May 7th at 7 p.m. All three are running for the chance to face the winner of the Republican primary for Senate in the November election, incumbent Chuck Grassley or challenger Jim Carlin. KCCI's Eric Hansen will co-moderate the May 7th debate along with KCRG's Ethan Stein, KTIV's Matt Bring, and KWQC's Hernan Gutierrez. Thank you so much for joining us for KCCI 8 News Close Up. We will see you back here next Sunday, same time. Have yourself a fantastic day.